Here we go. Emily, thank you for being on the podcast. I got to start with uh, the first question that I've been asking a lot of guests recently. What's your favorite superhero? My favorite superhero? Okay. Um, first one that comes to mind is uh, Wonder Woman. Awesome. I, it has to be a female. <laughs> yeah. Girl power. <laughs> totally. So, yeah. So, I, I talked to um, David Burke, who's uh, Networking Sciences, uh, a few weeks ago. And that's a question he always uses to kind of gauge people's mindsets. And since it's, it's a lot different than most questions that you would start with, which most people, it's like, how's the weather? How are these other things going? He's like, throw a, a, something random in there. Yeah, that was random, but I hope I passed the test. <laughs> yeah. I mean, hey, it's uh, completely... I think uh, Wonder Woman right now with the popularity of the movie as well yeah. is a very popular uh, answer because it's like, who doesn't want to be the girl who's like the badass chick doing everything? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Awesome. So I got to, we have to start with your story and how you got interested in basically going back to this movement patterns and utilizing the feet as one of the main mechanisms for literally turning your body on when you're doing anything. Where did that interest come from? How did you get started? I'd love to hear that story. Yeah. So it's kind of an interesting um, journey, I guess. Um, I was, I was a competitive gymnast. So for 13 years, competitive uh, gymnast, which is a barefoot sport. So that kind of played oh. into that a little bit. Um, and then I started in fitness when I was 21 and started teaching classes, training clients. And but then I started getting hurt, injured <laughs> <laughs> so much, which I'm sure a lot of group X instructors and, and such could experience that or appreciate that. So I started looking at advanced education that I could get that still allowed me to be in fitness, be in movement, just, you know, that, that profession, fed my soul in a sense. I love movement. I think movement is beautiful. But for me to physically use my body, I knew that there wasn't a, a longevity to that. So mm -hmm. I wanted to have something that could create a great pattern in job security in a sense as I get older. Again, that doesn't have to use my body as my tool. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where I started looking at medical school. At that time, I was a trainer in New York City in Manhattan, and I did not want to leave Manhattan. I love Manhattan. I was just telling you, I've been here for eight years, so it's a big part of my soul as well. So I was looking at medical schools, osteopathic schools, any school that was in Manhattan, and then I came across podiatry. I didn't know what podiatry was. I, I'm from the Midwest that I was, you know, we didn't have really podiatrists in the sense of how I think of it. Um, so I went and I was like, okay, it was in the city. I got accepted. So I was like, oh, I'm going to be a podiatrist. Okay. And then I started to see movement different because I was getting this new insight on the foot, foot movement. And because I had a movement background and was a personal trainer and in fitness, I was connecting dots in a way that some of my classmates weren't. And then I graduated, got pushed into surgery because every podiatrist has to do surgery. <laughs> it, it was very like nails on a chalkboard to me. It wasn't yeah. part of my belief. So I actually left residency, went back to school, got my master's in human movement. And that was the thing in between that connected it. Awesome. Because at first I was like, I love fitness. I have this podiatry degree, but how do I combine them in a way that's actually going to be fulfilling and, you know, be kind of my purpose. And that really was the master's degree in human movement. And it also pushed me even further into academia and education. So I started my education company. Everything that my education was focused on was barefoot and foot. So I also want to add that all of this was happening at the time of the Born to Run book coming out and uh, the barefoot running boom. Yeah. So honestly, that's a big part of why I got into this barefoot as well, because it was just at the time that I was getting my master's and starting yeah. traveling and lecturing within the education circuits and conferences. And I started seeing people educating about barefoot because barefoot was now a hot term, but they weren't necessarily qualified. And yes. you didn't really understand the foot. So I was like, okay, like if, if anyone is going to go and like create some established guidelines on safety and progressions mm -hmm. and training and et cetera, et cetera, I was like, 
which should be me because I'm the only podiatrist in the fitness industry. So let me, so then that's really kind of led to it as well. Uh, Long story short is I then went back to residency so that I could get my medical license. So I learned to do surgery, but I shaped my medical practice around holistic practices, functional medicine, functional movement. So the way that I treat my patients is very much in the belief of um, natural movement. I don't put them in orthotics. And now that's completely shaped my, I guess, career and my identity or my brand is around barefoot science, natural movement, um, functional medicine. So that's, it was a little bit of a zigzag, but. Hey, that's, yeah. As long as you got there. Now I have, so during that barefoot running boom, I had uh, the same sense of, hey, I need to start barefoot running. I remember one day it was about 95 degrees out and I've never really run or went, went barefoot anywhere. I'm like, I'll go for a barefoot run. I come back. I could barely walk on my feet for probably a week and a half because I burnt the heck out of them. Yes. I had no idea what I was doing and I'm hitting hard like pavement over and over and over again. That was... Uh, one of those traps that a lot of people fall into. But so you were talking about, you kind of went counter to the whole movement of orthotics and podiatry. And where was that like intuitive sense of getting away from like basically the cast that hold our feet? Uh, Well, I think another innate part of my personality is that I just question things. So any professional that's Mm -hmm. challenging the norms of Western medicine or chiropractic or physical therapy or whatever the specialty might be is really the person that's going to um, innovate or create a new approach Mm -hmm. in a sense, right? So when I was learning everything in podiatry school and in residency, let's say if someone had plantar fasciitis, there's like a templated stretch your calf this way go into new balance shoes go into and i was like well why new balance yeah why like i mean granted you're recording this but like did they pay oh 100 percent. right so i'm just like well why is new balance better than the others and i would start asking people and they're just like well no we recommend new balance or we recommend to do a calf stretch you know like against a wall where you drop your heel down yeah and I'm like, well, why would you do that one instead of a seated one? Yeah. Why would you do that instead of down dog? I don't know. Like, and they weren't able to really like kind of answer these things because it was essentially just regurgitating what you're taught. Yep. And oh, that just doesn't sit right with me to just literally verbatim any professional in any profession. If you just learn something and then you just keep uh, regurgitating without thinking for yourself critically like you can't you can't do that <laughs> right yeah. so that, that's why i i challenged orthotics and the use of the orthotics however what i will say is that there are some patients that do need orthotics and when i make orthotics not to pat myself on the back but when i make orthotics my orthotics are the bomb like the prescription, <laughs> the prescription behind orthotics is what makes them effective yeah so, right, there's like a molding process. I know some podiatrists that use the exact same prescription, meaning the modifications of the orthotic, yeah. for every single patient, which means you're spending 500 to to $1,000, and you're just getting this general, like, I don't know, just mirror the foot and create, right? So there's really not much critical thought yeah. into the development of that orthotic, which is why in some cases they get a bad reputation because – you, you have to have a, a prescription that shows that you actually understand foot biomechanics. Yes. There's a lot of people that don't. And, you know, I mean, so when a patient needs orthotics, I'm going to make them really good, deep understanding orthotics to reflect what their needs are. Yeah. Yeah. And that's so, so I was originally going to school for neuroscience and I was going to go to, I was going to try DO, but I talked to a naturopathic doctor and he was like, you're going to get brainwashed. And they were telling me all this stuff. Luckily, like out of the blue, I got pulled out and went to a startup company. So something completely different. But it was always that mindset where I was like, this makes no sense. Why? Like, they're just like, yeah, uh, A, B, A, B. And no one's like, hey, does something else work? Or evidence of absence, maybe nothing 
is the actual key to this person's problem solving itself. So I love that you went in and then now you realize, yes, medicine and these things are useful when they need to be there. If they're not there, don't do it. And it has to be custom tailored to the person. It can't be like an insurance company that's like, hey, uh, yeah, so all of you are lumped into this and you all get this treatment. It's like, why? It's like, because you fit all the data models. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the foot is really complex. And I was, a, I was on the advisory board for this orthotic company. It was a new um, 3D printed orthotic. Right? Oh, yeah. so, like super cool. The way that they were scanning the foot was very high tech and the way that they were essentially having the computer and the printer create it. Right. So yeah. like the algorithms and what they were showing me and I was like, it's not going to work. Like it's not going to work because the foot is so complex and there's subtle little shifts of one bone drops a little yeah. bit and one is this way. And they like, wouldn't listen to me they raised a ton of money. Like, I don't know how many millions of dollars they raised from investors. And then a couple years later, they kept hitting wall, hitting wall, hitting wall, weren't really listening to my advice that, you know, yeah. and um, completely folded under because they, they couldn't get it. And I was like, it just shows you how complex the foot is, that it's yeah. really complex and not, not so many feet are not this template like what you're saying so you can't use the same prescription or oversimplify the foot because it's not it's not simple yeah so four years to learn nothing but the foot like podiatry school is four years of foot that is a, complex right <laughs> but you took it and you expanded it to a holistic point where it's a lot more how the body moves based on the foot. So I did want to dive in. What does a, um, I can't say perfect because there's no such thing as a perfect, but a well-functioning foot look like, function like, and feel like, because I feel like if people don't understand what it should feel like, they don't even know what they're doing or why they're doing it. Yeah, so when I look at the foot, particularly from this well-functioning one, is there's, there's two ways that you want to look at the foot from a biomechanical perspective. So meaning, you know, high arch, dorsiflexion, pronate, supinate, like probably terms that the listeners have heard of. Yeah. That's biomechanics or kinematics. And then there's the sensory neuroscience, neuromuscular side to it. You have to have both of those. So if you look at it from the biomechanical perspective, you could say, okay, this uh, properly functioning foot, you know, maybe you think neutral, decent arch, the back of the heel is not dropping in or mm -hmm. collapsing, right? So it's a stable foot. But then that stable foot can go back and forth between, uh, in podiatry, we call it locking and unlocking okay. or supinate pronate, right? So you're just, you're going back and forth between two positions that allow you to become stable and unstable so that you can move with the ground and absorb impact and then release the energy and right. So you're kind of kinematically moving that way. That would be an ideal foot. So it's stable, but it's also flexible. Awesome. Right. Or mobile and stable. Right. So that's really your balance. Um, now from a sensory perspective, you need a foot that is anticipating the ground. Mm. You need a foot that is actually communicating to the rest of the body particularly to the core, so that you create stability during dynamic movement. Now, that's, that's the, the part that you can't necessarily see, yeah. right? So that takes um, intuitive assessment or years of understanding the way that the body works. And that, that's how I build my practice, right? So if I had a biomechanically perfect foot, mm -hmm. we'll say, come into my office and have plantar fasciitis, still have plantar fasciitis, then I can't say, oh, well, high arch feet get plantar fasciitis or flat feet over pronated feet have plantar fasciitis. Well, you don't have that, so I don't know why you have it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that's where some docs would say like, I don't know, right? So then that's why I would tell the patient that this has nothing to do with like your foot structure. Now yeah. I have to start looking at do you have a sensory or a neuromuscular disconnect between your body and the ground? Meaning, what shoes are you wearing? If you lock lots of cushion in your shoes and you create a sensory disconnect from the skin on the bottom of the foot, well, you have no idea how you're moving. 
So I need to make your foot a little bit faster from a sensory perspective so that you can control dynamic movement. So that's kind of the way that I would approach yeah, a patient yeah. when it's my office. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, I've been taking the soles out of my shoes for, I don't know, the last six, seven years just to try to get that. I do wear Vibrams and I did want to ask you, are those actually good? I mean, I'm just like, if it works, it works. If not, I'm just wearing goofy looking shoes and I'm fine doing it because I don't really care. Yeah. So, um, the five fingers I do like, Mm -hmm. um, I particularly don't have, I have a Nike. I don't have a, I don't have a, uh, five finger next to me. There's something about the, the Vibram will go like this. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So you don't want to just look at a shoe going this way, but you want to look at a shoe going oh. that way. Okay. Right? Now, the reason why you want to look at that aspect of the shoe is that I teach, when I teach professionals and I teach like body weight movements, whether you're doing pull ups or whatever it is that you're jumping, things yeah. like that, is that. You, you want to be able to engage the muscles in the bottom of your foot mm-hmm. and you engage them when you do like a point or a plantar flex, right? So yeah. the ankle goes down. That movement actually engages the bottom of the foot, the calf, all the way into your pelvic floor and into your glutes. So there is a, it's actually called a muscle synergy. Yeah. So a muscle synergy or a coactivation that happens between the foot, core, glutes, when you move. So five fingers actually allow your foot to go down and okay. gain that you're actually more stable. A lot of these other shoes, um, I do consulting for Nike and yeah. actually a lot of these companies, I'll do different consulting for them. And that's one feature that they don't necessarily factor in. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I speak to them and it's, you have to appreciate just a different function of the foot. You can't just think of the foot as, you know, propelling you forward. Yeah. And the only action that a shoe is important for is walking or running. Like when you're doing pull-ups, let's yeah. say, yeah. Right? you should be engaging your feet when you do a pull-up and you will be stronger. Awesome. Right. Yeah. So your five fingers will allow you to do that. Awesome. Yeah. So yeah, I noticed that I definitely grip the ground more. And sometimes when I would walk with shoes that didn't allow me to really move my foot or have air I would notice that sometimes it would seem like something isn't turning on while I'm walking like my knees almost buckle a little and I'm like this is I'm just doing a regular walk why are my knees buckling or it becomes I guess one of those things that I know a lot of girls wear high heels and stuff and they don't realize like when it comes to high heels or different sorts of shoes how would you rehab that or at least learn to reactivate those muscles because In high heels, you're literally firing constantly in one position and your toes are learning to, yeah, it's point downwards. Mm -hmm. How would you rehab that or come back to normal foot posture day to day when you're not wearing high heels if you work eight hours a day in them? Yeah, so when the foot is in a high heel, think of it, try to think versus just the biomechanics, right? So it's Mm -hmm. biomechanics and sensory is what we have to think of both of them. So when you're in a high heel, the listeners can picture a foot that's in a high heel. That's essentially a rigid position, Mm -hmm. right? So like you said, the muscles are always activated, but it's just, it's a rigid locked position, which means that when the woman gets out of the heels, her foot is so used to being locked that it makes it very difficult to unlock, Mm -hmm. which means that it's going to make it difficult to absorb impact forces. So mobility of the foot and the pelvis, all the muscles around the pelvis are really important because you have to undo the rigidity yeah. of high heels, right? And then whenever you think of the feet, you also want to think of the pelvis. So you cannot think of the feet alone. Your feet and your pelvis, from an evolutionary perspective, mm-hmm. are functionally connected. So you have a pelvis, low back, hip problem, right? You're most likely going to have a foot problem or vice versa, right? So all of my patients, when they get foot rehab, their part of their rehab is addressing the lumbopelvic hip complex as well. Oh, that is very interesting. So that just, and I don't know if you know anything about this, this is just a random thought. I get a lot of those, but when women are pregnant, 
is there a difference in the way that they walk because they're being more protective to that hip area because of the connection? Yes. So women, pregnancy is really hard on the body <laughs> uh, <laughs> because it's shifting your center of gravity, mm -hmm. right? So you have a shift in gravity that's taking your pelvis and it's throwing it forward, right? So you're mm -hmm. falling into a lordotic or an anterior tilt, which as soon as your pelvis goes forward, that actually deactivates your mus um, your deep core muscles, right? Yeah. Pelvic core, TBA, obliques, things like that. So that's a strike one, right? Yeah. And then strike two is you are the size of the baby and the growing uh, fetus is lengthening all of the abdominal muscles. So now you deactivate the abdominal muscles because you just changed the length tension relationship. Yeah. I got that, right? So that's a strike two. Um, now, because of that position and that change, you're going to actually externally rotate your hips. So kind of like waddling. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But you have to externally rotate your hips which actually further destabilizes your deep pelvic muscles. And then that puts stress all the way down into the feet. So, and then you get an increase in relaxin, which there's over a hundred ligaments in the feet. Mm -hmm. So relaxin when that's released during, towards the end of pregnancy and then actually for up to a year post-pregnancy is the feet are going to drop down, lengthen, expand, where a lot of people mm. will say like, oh, since I was pregnant or after my second pregnancy, my shoe size went up. That really is the relaxin acting on the 107 ligaments that are in the foot. Yeah. So I will actually advise my patient pregnant, especially for third trimester and then the first three months post-pregnancy to use orthotics. Okay. Um, yeah, because you want to hold the shape of the foot and try to resist some of that relaxing, widening, lengthening. So that that's kind of a, some people might think that that's counter to natural movement beliefs, <laughs> but that is one position where I recommend them. Yeah, because, well, I would say it would be natural counter movement beliefs so long as before and after you were naturally moving. But if you're not naturally moving during, then... <laughs> right. And so none of us or most people don't naturally move. So then that comes into play um, with exercises or learning to feel the foot again, because I know with any type of sensory input, that is quite literally what leads to a high quality life because you can feel the, like everything and senses is what makes the richness of life come about. How would you go back to incorporating these different ways of having your feet sense and really feeling them because it takes some body awareness that I know a lot of people don't have would love to work on but have no idea how to get started yes so I would encourage I mean one you can start to get out of your shoes in your home it's mm -hmm. probably the easiest um you'd probably be surprised the number of people who wear shoes from the moment they get up to the moment they go to bed. I have many patients that are like, really not, not, not now in my practice, but where I practiced before I, I would just hear patients and they would just, from the moment they wake up to the moment they go, or if they're around their home, they'll have um, like sandals or slippers or something. They just yeah. never their foot. Right. Um, so that would probably be the easiest one is to walk around barefoot on, in your home, whether it's the wood surface, um, some of the tiles in homes, the carpet, et cetera. So you're just getting some of that natural stimulation. Mm -hmm. I would then bring it into a more, two ways on how you want to do it. You could either bring it into the outside, mm -hmm. meaning going barefoot, totally barefoot on the grass. So find, you know, a park, um, if you have a backyard, yeah. some sort of like earth, ground, dirt, grass environment and if you can get 15 minutes of barefoot on the earth stimulation one that's called earthing and grounding which is yes <laughs> right yeah. if you want to go down that track um which has a very powerful way but it also is reconnecting you to the natural side of being barefoot right so you could literally be barefoot outside on the grass incorporate earthing the other way that you could do it or you could do both of these is to switch your footwear when you are in the gym into more minimal shoes. Yeah. 
right? So that could be the five fingers like you have. Mm -hmm. It could be Vivo Barefoot, New Balance Minimus, Ultra, uh, Nike Free. What, there's so many different brands um, that switching to those. Now, minimal shoes and barefoot shoes, if you want to call them that, mm. are not for running, not just running, right? So sometimes people are like, well, I'm not a runner, so I'm not going to wear yeah. minimal shoes. Minimal shoes are not for running, just running, right? So if you take your weekly um, toning class at the gym or you train with a trainer a couple times a week or you go on your own and you do lifting and you know elliptical work, whatever, that's where you would want to switch to the minimal shoes. And it's, it's an easy transition because you're not doing high impact movements. Mm -hmm weight you're squatting you know you're on the elliptical but it just kind of gets you connected um while you're doing any of these i would incorporate doing uh foot release so five minutes in the morning five minutes in the evening release your feet on a golf ball lacrosse ball okay bad roller uh foot waker there's so many different products but if you release your feet five minutes morning five minutes evening i tell people to do it when they're brushing their teeth Mm -hmm. right so you're kind of multitasking right yeah. so i make it kind of a lifestyle thing so i leave i have little foot wakers and i leave them in my bathroom so when i'm literally brushing my teeth i'm releasing my feet right yeah. so no excuse it's there do one do the other um that would be a big part of this transition as well and then you can start doing intentional foot exercises if you want to take yoga yeah. technically that would be Pilates. Um, I teach short foot. I teach barefoot movement on my own outside mm -hmm. of um, podiatry and education. I'll send you a I'll send you a link to post on the YouTube awesome. channel, which is teaching short foot, um, and it's a great exercise to start activating your feet. And then from there, you can just start to change all of your footwear into minimal footwear or more natural footwear. Yeah. So. Okay, with that, I've been doing uh, cars for my ankles, and I know that's helping a lot. And I'm noticing that neural connection of like in uh, certain places, it gets sticky almost. And I'm like, oh, this is so cool. Because I mean, I approach it from like the weird, like, this is awesome. I get to know all the things about my body, as well as like lifting up different toes and trying yep. to see if I can yep. get that moving. But I love the, the golf ball in the morning to relax the foot. Is would you say, there's a difference between the conscious ability to move it around and then the, because in one you're relaxing through the golf ball, the other one you're relaxing through kind of like, or bringing it through a full rotation. Um, are those going to be kind of like two pieces that together is like, that's the next level? Yes. I would say to do, to do them together. Now the most important thing when it comes to, uh, either any transition or if you do have some active pain mm -hmm. is that consistency yeah. is the most important thing. And that's what I tell my patients is I'm trying to create a lifestyle. So I'm not giving them a hundred things to do, a hundred exercises, do this three times a day or three times a week. Da, 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 da. I give them, you know, a few simple ones that they do every single day, maybe a couple times every single day. And then they're going to do that every single day for a good month before mm -hmm. they come back to me and I add on to it. Right. Yeah. Because these are things that have to be lifestyle. Totally. Your, your feet take a beating. Even if you don't exercise and you just walk around and walk around the office, your feet take a beating. So they need a little bit of a reset or a recovery every single day. Mm -hmm. And that's just offsetting pain and et cetera and stress but it's also ensuring the longevity of your feet and the longevity of your movement. Totally. And yeah, so that brings up a few points. One is um, I know I used to sprain ankles all the time and I think it's because of the balance and where I put weight. Cause I noticed uh, a while back when I would stand for long periods, I would stand on one side more heavily. Um, and nowadays, especially wearing the vibrams, my feet do get a lot more sore is what would you say for these longer duration exercises? So there's like meditation, which your feet are in a different position for like, I'll do one to three hour meditation. Sometimes I know my feet are not happy being in that position, at least at the beginning, because of course mm -hmm. it's going to take time. But also if you're getting ankle sprains or standing for a long time, 
and you notice that you're moving back from side to side, how would you uh, intersplice uh, almost relaxation techniques throughout those points in time? If you're standing a long period or if you're doing a long meditation? Yeah. Um, so with the standing, what I would say, like standing desks, yeah. transition to the, right, is yep. standing is unnatural sitting is unnatural. So what actually feeds our body and our nervous system and our mm -hmm. connective tissue is moving. <laughs> so continuously moving really is what provides kind of the deviation of stress. Yeah. Because right? as you move, there's um, hydration or fluid, water, right? Kind of circulating throughout the mm -hmm. body. You get different electrical changes. You get, it's a big old you know, chemistry too, that's just kind of moving and shifting. So the best way is to continuously move. So if you have a standing desk, um, you almost need to be like a fidgeter. Yeah. Being totally static. Um, locked like out. You, yeah, like locked out like that. That can actually increase your risk of plantar fasciitis, Achilles tendonitis, and things like that. So I have quite a few patients with standing desks that I've seen an uptick in those foot conditions as standing desks have become more popular. So just be a little bit aware of that and incorporate foot release, mm -hmm. um, be barefoot will give a better connection or just kind of change your shoes out. A lot of trainers that, that I teach stand on the floor, on the gym floor, right? Yeah. And they'll stay, stand in five fingers or like totally minimal shoes. And even they will get plantar fasciitis and Achilles tendonitis. So you either mm -hmm. have to reach your feet. You know, I'll actually tell a lot of those trainers to get orthotics. Yeah. Just when they're standing because standing is not natural. So you have to help the body avoid that, that repetitive continuous stress. So when you're sitting, you're sitting in like Lotus, right? When yeah. You're yeah. Yeah. So you're... You're in a position that, I mean, that's just a constant stress yeah. to your connective tissue, right? And if you happen to not have the flexibility, you actually might be pulling on the nerves a little bit. Oh. Sorry, I had a, a friend who was sitting on his feet. You know, like if you were doing like a child pose, you're... Yeah. Yeah. And he would he would sit on his feet to get more plantar flexion because he knows that when you point your ankle down, you engage the bottom of your feet, so you have higher mm -hmm. core. So he appreciates that connection. But he doesn't have a lot of plantar flexion or point because he's a guy, guys yeah. are women. Um, you know, if a guy hasn't been in like dance or gymnastics or anything oh. like that until they're like 35 and now they're like, oh, I want to do, you know, body weight <laughs> movement or something, right? You're just not going to have a lot. So he would sit on his feet for like 30 minutes an hour, just kind of like to try to like yeah. change the connective tissue to create more plantar flexion. So this one time he was doing this, this maybe like a year ago and he did it before he went to bed, went to bed, woke up. He had foot dropped on one side. Like he literally like his foot, he thought he had a stroke and because he had pulled the nerve. Okay. Obviously, that he injured the nerve and he freaked out, called me and I was like, listen, you just have, it's called neuropraxia where you almost like yeah. when you sleep on your arm and it falls asleep and then you like kind of shake it out. He essentially had that, but a little bit more serious. I put him in a boot. Obviously it came back yeah. you know, like a month later, but I mean, that's scary. So yeah. just being aware of like continuous static positions like a Lotus, if you are like forcing yourself into Lotus and you might not have the flexibility for a full Lotus, yeah you can create some stress on the body that can upset it to the point of injury. And that's very interesting about the foot drop. Cause I did notice when I would do certain exercises um, a long while ago, uh, like go for a long run and I haven't ran in a long time. My feet would, instead I'd have a pole. It would pull upwards. Okay. So, wow, that is okay. I, now I understand it a little bit more. And then with the connective tissue and what he was doing, isn't connective tissue it kind of works because of that brain neural connection. So if you're just sitting into something and you're not actively doing it, then it's not really even training the tissue as much as it could. Be right. I mean, the, so there is the, it's called creeping. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, creeping takes a long time though. So for you to 
like they try to do it with the ankle and the Achilles tendon that if you use a, a night splint, yeah. right? So let's say if I have a child that's walking on their toes, part of the initial treatment, you're right that it's really more neurological, right? Mm -hmm. Even if it's idiopathic toe walking, it's still a neurological yeah. driver or a sensory driver to why the child is on that, right? But still part of it of what you can try could be a night splint and you essentially brace the ankle in a 90 degree while the yeah. adult when the child is sleeping and then the purpose of that is to try to create some sort of uh deformation or creeping effect but you have to it's it takes a long time to do that right yeah. so really the efficacy of doing something like that i agree he's just not going to get the change yeah. especially at 35 years old or 40 <laughs> years, you know what i mean you just don't get it when yeah. you're a child when you're a child you could I like the using the night though for certain uh, training principles. Like I wear a tape over my mouth at night to make sure that my lips are sealed. Cause I know in the past I had mouth breathing and I talked to an expert on this and he was saying uh, you're narrowly trained to be like, Oh, I don't breathe through the mouth for those eight hours, six hours, however long someone sleeps. And that's actually a cool way to do it where you could use it at night. I definitely see how it takes a lot longer because if you're not consciously intending it, then you go do something else and you're like, oh no, it's working at night. I don't need to even do it right now. Right. Yeah. So you also have a yoga mat and a few other utensils basically to help sensitize to different surfaces that are actually proven by science to make the foot work better, to make the muscles fire better. I wanted to talk a little bit more about those because I think that's so interesting and texture is not something we normally think of as a main driver towards uh, the proper use of our bodies. Yeah, so um, what you're referencing is Naboso, which I'll show you the insoles. If you can see the texture. Yeah. There you go. So um, the skin on the bottom of the feet has unique nerves, similar to the hand. So the hand and the feet, the bottom, um, has different nerves that are called mechanoceptors or touch receptors. Mm -hmm. receptors. And those touch receptors are sensitive to texture, stretch, and vibration. So, and then also there's pain and temperature and kind of yeah. other well. But the main ones, particularly for dynamic movement, are the texture, the stretch, and the vibration. Now, when you look at posture, dynamic posture, and sway or balance or um, the sense of a joint, so mm -hmm. let's say my knee or my hip or my ankle, the faster that I can sense it, the um, faster I can stabilize it right? So if I'm not sensing it, I can't stabilize it. Mm. So there's a lot of research around stimulating the bottom of the foot through texture. But the way that texture is perceived, I'm going to show this again, yeah. is through two point discrimination. So two points, right? There's two little pyramids or dots on here, almost like braille. So if you're familiar. Oh, okay. With yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, and Braille is on ATMs. So if people want to look at it again, right? Look at the ATM next time you go. And the two points, this Braille is how your brain is differentiating if something is rough or smooth. And research has shown that two-point discrimination as the texture mm -hmm. can actually decrease sway or it can improve your posture. It can enhance uh, impact forces when you run. It uh, enhances the sense of your knee after ACL reconstruction. Um, it's very powerful in uh, multiple sclerosis or Parkinson's or post-stroke or post-concussion. So essentially I was kind of traveling around lecturing and yeah. started speaking a lot around texture and saw all this textured research and then realized that there was no, no one did anything with it, yeah. right? So if you show these amazing results, if you put texture in your shoes or you stand on texture and you do your rehab exercises, that it can, it can actually enhance your activation and your neuromuscular control, right? But no one yeah. makes it accessible. So that's really why I developed Naboso. Um, show the words so you can see it. So the Naboso. Yeah. And... 
under Naboso, we have the insoles, and then we have our training mat. So you can see the texture on here. Yeah. So we have been getting crazy exciting results, and it's, it's really cool to see how we're helping people from those who just have plantar fasciitis to those who actually have MS or Parkinson's um, to those who are, you know, post knee surgery or those mm -hmm. who are just training. But we're essentially looking at the foot from a sensory near muscular perspective, which is what I said, you have to do both of it. Right. Yeah. And when you get into the brain, you get much better results because ultimately movement is sensory. So yeah. if I want to, if I want to improve my posture, I, I need to think about how can I do this from a sensory perspective, not just, Oh, shift my pelvis and, you know, roll my shoulders back. That's skeletal. And the skeleton is just a reaction of the nerves mm -hmm. which they feed into every, Right. So, um, we have really, really, really cool results. Um, you know, I'll give you the website, which you can share with everyone, but it's yeah. the technology. And we have some really cool, exciting stuff coming out as far as how we can help people move better and move longer. Awesome. So I'm going to ask uh, final three questions, then we'll talk about your book for a second, and then I'll let you go back on to your day. But do you have any higher leverage skills that you've used that have helped you get to where you are? So a higher leverage skill is something like learning to learn better because you can learn basically anything then a lot better, uh, breathing better, because if you can breathe better, then you can do most things a lot better. Um, pattern recognition. It's basically, you can learn it in any field and then apply it in so many different areas. And it's something that continues to come up. Could be a mindset as well. But do you have anything like that that you've used that have really helped you get to where you are? That is a really interesting question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do a lot of podcasts and I've never been asked that. Um, I would say, so patterns of like what I remember from school is I do have a little bit of a photographic memory. Yes. So I would say that's something that I had used to my advantage going through like med school and, and stuff like that, that that kind of shaped it. Um, I would also have to say that I have like a, a crazy focus that and time management. I don't know if yeah. from being a gymnast and from six years old all the way to, you know, freshman in college, I had to balance being, you know, training four hours after school to then doing homework. And then the process of winning and losing was taught, mm -hmm. right? So the, I mean, I would like lose and cry. And I remember all that. Yeah. Right? And we, they didn't give medals <laughs> to like yeah. last yeah. Piece when I was a child, right? That it kind of taught you like, no, you lost, but get better and like still believe in yourself, pick yourself up. And exactly. you know, so it kind of, it shaped that. So I, I have a really, um, focused aspect to discipline and continued like laser beam focus on the future. Awesome. So, yeah. I don't awesome. know if that answers your question, but that was, yeah, no, totally. It's uh, the ability to manage time effectively for something that you're doing in the future. So it's more of a long-term time management of uh, strategy. Yeah. I always think big picture. Yeah. That is awesome. So is there anything right now that you're currently questioning? And so earlier we talked about it and you said you question everything, which is awesome because that's something that I constantly say, but this could be religion, politics. It could be literally anything that lately you've been going, I really just don't think it works that way. Um, well, what I would say is hopefully this answers your question as well. Um, in area of like where I'm exploring more, we'll say yeah. more, more is I'm very big on like energy and intuition and consciousness. Yes. So I try to learn and understand intuition and kind of the interoception and that aspect of consciousness. So a higher vibrational kind yeah. of more energy. So, which takes me, very out of the Western and into the Eastern. And mm -hmm. some people are either like ready 
for that, like, you know, they could kind of like relate or understand or they read and they believe it. And then others are just like, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> but I do, like, I feel like there's a vibration through my body, which totally sounds like, like I'm a, I don't know, Buddha no. or something. But I do feel like there is a vibration. And when I'm, when I'm open to the opportunities and when I'm building Naboso, I feel like there's a, my vibrational frequency changes when I am pushing towards Naboso and my company that I feel like things are happening and will happen in a way that I can't explain. I yeah. 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 It's a very basic level of vibration. If you're not going from this, the more spiritual side, which like I'm a huge fan of conscious, higher consciousness is one of the areas that I often talk about, but it's like, if you think about it almost as from like the, smallest detail as a yes or no and you chose the yes or the no that's a vibration ripple that goes for literally everything so you can vibrate at a higher level because if every single choice is a yes or no and everything is then everything works in rhythms and waves and vibrations so you are vibrating at a higher level because you're like oh these people came into my life because at the very beginning this happened this choice and it doesn't have to be from you it could be external circumstance but yeah Yes. Yeah, so I, I think about that a lot. Lastly, are you obsessed with anything right now? Um, could be a thing, a book, an idea, whatever it is. Um, ooh, again, these are great questions. Um, yes. So I would say that I am obsessed with brain optimization. Awesome. I would say that. Yeah. So the biohacking side of brain optimization. Are you currently doing anything for that? Uh, I mean, I do a lot of stuff. <laughs> I do. Um, I'm very big into nootropics mm -hmm. and infrared. There's a system called Nucalm. I don't know if you've heard of it. So it changes the brain waves into theta waves. Mm. Um, I'm big in flotation tanks. So kind of that, that side of getting into flow. Yeah. So that's very much of it. But then also, um, I mean, literally everything of what you were saying with the mouth breathing or the, yeah. the taping your mouth. Yeah. My, my mind went to, oh, you would get higher brain oxygenation when you're sleeping, when you mm -hmm. breathe through your nose. So any reference that you would say, I would bring it back to the brain somehow because yeah. that's your, your command central is everything there. Um, so my fascination is that. So when I speak of brain as a podiatrist, sometimes people are like, where did you <laughs> like? Yeah. But really it's movement and everything that's movement is nervous and nervous system is brain. So it, Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Have you so have you explored the mouth breathing CO2 yes. stuff? So I don't know. Do you know Dr. Lois Laney? Uh, I do not. So I would check out her work. Her yeah, definitely. Her program is called Restorative Breathing, and she's actually big in doing cranial nerve resets, and so almost like vagal tone. Yeah. Is part of it, but she puts a um, tongue depressor in between the teeth, and then you'll hum and swallow while she's doing these neural resets. So she's big on cranial yeah. nerve, vocal tone, um, nose breathing, not mouth breathing. It's, it's a really fascinating stuff. And she, she uses a lot of the Naboso stuff because she ties in cranial nerves with the homunculus, which is the hands yep. and the So she stimulates those on the Naboso mat while doing this Vegas reset hum and swallow thing with it. It's really cool. That is awesome. Yeah, I was talking to uh, Patrick McGowan. He, re he wrote uh, The Oxygen Advantage. Yep, yep. And then I talked to another uh, guy named Brad Pilon who wrote Eat, Stop, Eat originally on intermittent fasting, but his newest book is Thin Air. And he was talking about how just like the podcast we're doing right now, breathing, we're breathing so much. The CO2 in here is probably 700, 800 parts per million, which is like crazy high. While you sleep, it gets up to 1,400. So like cracking a window once in a while increases the oxygen in the room. And then that triggered in my mind like, oh, so if you're just breathing through your nose, then the CO2 that you create, which is probably more unique to you, stays in your body, which is influencing the oxygen going into the veins, the brain. But by opening the windows, you're getting more fresh oxygen that allows your body to continually create that through the nose breathing. It blew my mind. That's so cool. I yeah. love that. It's really, there's so much fascinating stuff in the world of sleep medicine, yes. anti-aging, longevity. I mean, that 
it's so exciting. Yeah, it's so funny too because a lot of it's like, oh, uh, nose breathing. That's what every creature does, and mm-hmm. uh, we're supposed to do it. <sighs> fresh air. Oh my God, fresh air is good for you. It's crazy. Very simple stuff. Exactly. So everything we talked about and a lot more is in your newest book. Um, if you want to hold it up and then yeah. boom. So guys, walking barefoot is so important. Just learning how to utilize the body, especially with like, if you walk around barefoot and everything hurts, it's not, it shouldn't be that way. You should be able to realize that your feet are strong and they're smart. Nothing most things don't hurt when you grab them with your hands and your feet are very similar. I want to thank you for coming on the show. That was awesome. Uh, a lot of, a lot of awesome information. Yeah, it was fun. Thank you for inviting me and I hope the listeners enjoy. Oh yeah. So where can people find you before we wrap up? So a couple different, um, my, uh, education company is ebfaglobal.com. That links to our YouTube channel. Um, there's a lot of information on that YouTube channel, which is youtube.com backslash EBFA fitness exercises. I do different video blogs, um, different exercises, kind of, uh, shoot things from my office, educating patients and then barefootstrong.com is for the book nabososechnology.com is for the insoles and then for my practice it's just my name so dr emily splickle.com awesome well thank you so much yeah of course and i'm going to send people your way thank you so much good thank you